thank you very much. Hello? It's working? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to see you uh, always. Uh, I want to know your personal evaluation of the refugee situation globally. Do you think that things overall are moving in the right direction? And if so, how can we make it faster? And if it's not moving in the right direction, how do you think we can rectify this situation? No, we'll take a few at a time. I think Dennis, you had it, and then I see Vicky. So we have You're the supposed to be answering questions. the questions, Dennis, not asking. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, can you say a word? Can you say a word about? Uh, um, I'm my guessing. favorite subject, IDPs. I know it's a mandate question, but why did they get five lines saying Well, you're it? lucky they got five lines. Yeah. It's not supposed to be there at all. <laughs> I'm not so lucky. They're not so lucky. They're not so lucky. <laughs> Can you say a word about that process? And secondly, you know, we've seen protection of refugees going downhill steadily until now. What about monitoring implementation of these grand uh, declarations? That New York Declaration covers everything from the UN Charter to the Refugee Convention and a whole lot in between, as you know very well, better than me. Is there any way, was there any discussion about possible monitoring mechanisms? Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's maybe a little bit related to the ambassador's question, but um, you mentioned climate change at the beginning. We know that this situation is likely to get worse. Um, so was there a sense at the summit that um, we're trying to address problems now in order to create a stronger framework so that we are better prepared to deal with those situations in the future? Because what we're seeing today may in fact only be the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we, sorry to use a metaphorical, yeah. <laughs> in terms of what we see in the future, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Or was it, you know, stick the finger in the dike kind of uh, attitude um, and basically we, we, we try to deal with the problem today and then just hope that it goes away? <laughs> I'm Fadla Wumat from Muslim Aid. We're working in many of these countries. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask you about the IDP issue because uh, th that is really a, a disaster also, and UNHCR doesn't really have the, the mandate to, to, to take care of them. Uh, secondly, we have politicians like the ex-Prime Minister of Australia, who just gave a speech a few days ago in Europe, the Margaret Thatcher memorial letter, that lecture by the way, uh, where he, he said that he urged Europe to take Australia's horrible turn back the boats policy. He, he, he said that uh, we have to, we, the only compassionate thing to do is not let them in. Uh, and he's certainly not following the teachings of his holy father that he was going to be a priest of uh, uh, in his er earlier life. And he even had the hide to say, don't love your neighbor, that's going to create a disaster for Europe. So, and there are a lot of politicians in the world like him. How do we overcome that? And, and it's not only him. Let's look at uh, Hasina in Dhaka, where you're going to go, who is turning back the Rohingya refugees who have absolutely no rights and going back to their death. So how, I mean, you were a bit optimistic. I, I, I'm sort of thinking how... How do we change the conversation? How do we deal with this sort of demonization of, of refugees by very prominent politicians, both in the East and, and the West? Thank you. Okay, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Better you than me. <laughs> I, I just repeat what I said already. Um, how do we rectify? What, what we've got now to the refugee situation and get it in the right direction. Well, that's some of the things, and it answers some of the other questions, too, of trying to get everyone together on, on this issue, that we're talking not just about our leaders, some of whom are like this, uh, but some of whom are quite good and are giving good examples, and having the people 
mobilized as well. Uh, we have lots of NGOs, as I mentioned, and the, the faith-based organizations, where sometimes we separate them, but um, they're, they're all on board. That's where you can get them, and if they, you know, if they go out and do their, their diplomatic uh, work, then they will get more and more people on board. I see something like that. I, I was surprised when I retired to Chicago, and I found that, you know, who's, who are the peace people? Who are the pro-Palestinians I was looking for first? They were all from the churches, you know, so it was, it was quite uh, happily, I, that, that was a, a good sign. Um, so that's what we say. We have to get everyone, institutions, UN institutions, civil society. And now we're seeing more and more interest by the private sector, which is why I sort of used the agency, advertising agency. They, they want to get in on, on these things. They think they're important. And uh, we know how important the private sector is. You know, if they come in and fund some of these things, that we need funding. If you have more resettlement places, and it's responsibility sharing, if not everybody's going to the same place or wanting to go to the same place, and uh, it, it, that that helps as well. So uh, we hope that if we do follow these and on the monitoring question, we, we that's partly uh, everybody will, uh, the organizations that have been charged with carrying out the things that they've made commitments to um, are going to have to report back. They'll be looking at uh, whether they do what they say they're going to do or not, uh, or they're, how they're getting along and trying to do it and that sort of thing. So that's, uh, we just, again, have to keep pushing and following. And I think we have a new, uh, incoming Secretary General who's on the right side of these things and uh, should be able to help us because he's uh, extremely competent and uh, is an, a great leader. So we'll hope that he, he gets not just the people around the UN but even beyond, I think, because people have quite a lot of respect for him. Um, Dennis, IDPs, yeah, as you say, mandate issue. We were told, you know, clearly, um, you're doing refugees and migrants. This had been discussed, of course, when they did the resolution, both from the Secretary General and then from the, the, the General Assembly. Uh, and, of course, they don't want IDPs. Again, that's even more than a migrants. That is an eternal situation. That's a sovereign situation because you're an IDP oftentimes, most times, because of the policies of your government. So they'll take care of that themselves, and they don't want it discussed among everybody uh, and the signs. So that's... Uh, why we went ahead, we were told not to even put that in there, that little little paragraph, little sentence, um, but we did, and they let it go. Um, and we have to, you know, find out what, what we can do about it. Uh, and what we really recommend when people asked, uh, we said well, it has to be dealt separately. You didn't want it dealt here, that's fine. We, we pretty much agreed with that. There was a lot of objection in the very beginning about even doing refugees and migrants together because it does sort of disadvantage one or the other, perhaps. That's why there was this question, balance, keeps them balanced in, uh, in every way. Um, and IDPs would have uh, introduced a, a further complication, especially internally in, in the countries um, who have big problems with them and uh, are trying to figure out how to deal with them themselves. Uh, so that is that. Um, about monitoring it, well, that was the, the thing. I think that we're, we're making sure that uh, that that we do this. There's a follow-up mechanism that's in place uh, after me. Uh, Izumi Nakamitsu, some of you will know who works for UNDP, was uh, pulled in to do one-third of a, a job. Uh, so she said, now I'm doing 200% of a job because my own job is extra 100% and now this job's supposed to be 30%. It's another 100%, you know, but uh, she's pretty tough and I think she's taking it on rather well. So, and as I said, you know, Zaka comes up uh, next week. Uh, so there'll be the follow-up on the migration side for that, for example. And, uh, you know, we expect UNHCR to be reporting throughout and consulting throughout the year, getting ready for the 2018 conference and so on. That's why they're there. Um, yeah, the climate change, of course, as we say, it's, uh, it is going to be worse than everything else. I mean, I, I, was, I was frightened myself when I met, as I said, with the least developed states and small island states especially. And some of what's happening even in the big states that are, you know, <laughs> on, the, on the ocean. Uh, so there, there's something. And this, you know, we say 65 million forcibly displaced people, 40 million of them are internally displaced. And so we use those figures so we were able to refer to internally displaced persons there too. Only 20 million refugees, but if we have the climate change we're going to have, you know, easily could double that in, in a short period of time and think. So not trying to stick the finger in the tank at all, really trying to say let's do some of these things to make sure that uh, you know the, 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 there's not even a hole in the dike um, that they can squeeze through. Uh, we have to do something, but it's uh, it was trying to look forward and uh, to build on things that are, are there. I mean, if we get 193 states to sign up by acclamation, by consensus, 
they ought to be able to influence each other as well. And if some lead well, I think we keep pointing out those good examples and sort of shame the others to, to do something uh, good themselves uh, as well. Um, there are all kinds of things that go into that, of course, of the, the kinds of people, you know, the, those, those strangers who sometimes are very big strangers, you know. Um, I gave a talk recently in Chicago, and um, there were good questions on the, uh, you know, decent questions about, uh, you know, I did a little thing about what happened in the summit, like part of this, and uh, the question's good, polite, and so on. And then afterwards, uh, while they were having their goodies and coming up to me one by one to ask, I mean, they really were asking questions like, but don't you think if these Muslims want to come here, they shouldn't wear a scarf? And well, I think of all the other people who have certain costumes or headdresses and you're not objecting to them. This is a thing that's, it's a Muslim thing now and we have to deal with that directly, I think, of the problem and the why this association with uh, ISIS and other things like this that make it a, a problem to have a woman wearing a scarf, you know? I mean, Orthodox people wear scarves, Sikhs wear turbans, I mean, you know, and nobody's fussing about that, but, you know, can't get, let these women do this, you know, sort of thing. Um, yeah, IDPs, no, but I've already said, we have, to, we have to encourage there to be a summit on IDPs, a convention on IDPs. We have to have a conference. We have to, you know, see what it works. And it only help if we, um, if we show some results from this summit. Otherwise, they'll say not enough. Because that's what they were saying to us about the consensus document, the negotiated outcome. We've had a lot of summits. Not a lot has come out of those other summits. And so we don't want another summit where we can say, well, we didn't sign up. We're going to sign up, and then we're going to have to do something. So it was a good sign from the beginning. I think. Um, we have Hans Jorgis here. He could maybe say something about IDPs because that's with the, with Ocho. Where are you, Hans Jorg? <laughs> anyway, did he go away? Yeah, <laughs> is he hiding? Anyway, but <laughs> they, they, they do have some of the major responsibility on, on, um, on IDPs uh, within the UN system at least. So, but it, it's a difficult issue since it is internal. Um, yeah, when, in which you, when you have a major political figure, especially like the Australians, I mean, we had a lot of interviews by Australian journalists during the summit, and they were there to criticize their own government and wanting to, to get statements made. But this thing about saying it's a great thing to do and you should all do this, turn back people, and we're, we're protecting them, we're saving them from death by coming, you know, yep. <laughs> and sending them off to really some of the most disgusting conditions you can imagine. Little kids are committing suicide on the island, on Nauru. Um, yeah, <laughs> what can we say? Who's the Australian here? Someone's from nearby. No? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get you in here. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh. <laughs> from the online audience, which I'll take, and then I'll no do another round in the room. Um, so we've got a question from Patrick Wall, consultant in Geneva, who would like to ask, there seems to be pessimism taking hold in some quarters that states will not be able to agree on concrete principles for the global compact on migration. And because the two compacts have been politically linked to one another, that this will doom the refugee compact as well. What are your views? That's the first question. The second question is from Gabrielle, or Gabriele, who would like to ask, do you see the Tur Turkey-EU deal as an indicator of a trend of, quote, developed countries responding to displacement crisis by, quote, undermining, reducing, unquote, the asylum regime and related obligations? Those are the two. <laughs> yeah, that's enough. Um. <laughs> uh -huh. um. Uh, th that, this was the whole thing about why we had to have the two compacts at the same time, only opposite to the question that um, our consultant in Geneva has asked, is that um, the people at the migration side said, if you do that refugee compact, which in some ways we thought could be already done during the, the negotiations in the summit, and you have it out there, because you have a legal regime, you can base it on, and so on. Um, they said, uh-uh, you do that, and we know what will happen to the migration conference. Very well, we'll forget, they'll go away, it won't be important. So we do them at the same time. So we said, okay, we'll do them at the same time, but, you know, we can see that, uh, and, but uh, ensuring that UNHCR gets right to work, is able to go ahead and start 
working on theirs uh, and just confirm it in 2018. And, and they, in the end, were happier with that, too, because they will get to prove that they're going to have a new way to go about responsibility sharing, you know, not just the neighboring countries are the ones who have to take the, the burden all the way, all the way along. So I, I, think, I think that it, it won't happen. Um, if there's no agreement on one of the compacts, I think uh, that, that would be a great shame. But I think at this moment, we should stick to the fact that there is optimism, there is uh, uh, interest, there's some initiative on making these things work. And um, perhaps we should have a talk after Dhaka to see how it has gone. I mean, they're, they're adding new topics to the to that conference every day. I was going to, I thought I was going to listen. Then they asked me to speak on one topic. So I said, oh, of course, you know, that's fine, I'll do that. Now it's three topics, because, you know, they're ad adding so many issues, you know, and I have to go a day earlier, because they're starting everything earlier and getting things going. So, you know, there's that enthusiasm. We have these two co-facilitators, within the UN system at least, who are champions of, of, of migration, Mexico and Bangladesh. Some people thought they were too champion, because if you get them too interested, then they have so many of their own interests or their country's interests. But I think it's good to have people who are going to keep it on the agenda and uh, make sure it keeps going. Yeah. Um, Turkey EU deal, what well, doesn't work? It wasn't a good deal. I don't think um, we want to <laughs> discuss it too much and say we should imitate it at all. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure that it has a, a real trend in reducing uh, asylum, uh, but you know, we're just out of pushing asylum and uh, pretty uh, hopeful that we'll keep going to to extend the, the, the benefits of, of asylum and of uh, accepting asylum seekers to, to, to many places and that, you know, paying money for one and exchanging one for two or something, these are not good ideas. There's Hans York, he'll be back to answer about the IDPs now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Oh, you did. That's why. You came <laughs> <laughs> and where would you like to respond? The question was posed about IDPs, and where do we? Would there? Will there be another? Uh, should there be another event on IDPs? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> where do we put them? Discuss. Uh, seriously now, or? <laughs> Is there something? I don't want to interrupt your lecture, sorry. No, I refer to... It was a question to that Karen sorry. actually asked. Look, um, Karen and I spoke uh, before the summit, and uh, I said, what can we do, what do we have to do about, uh, about IDPs? And Karen actually said, at that point already, um, I think we need to have a high-level meeting on, on, on IDPs because of the... Uh, drama, and if you really look over the last four or five years, what we've been doing, and everyone is with impatience waiting for the next um, um, NRC figures, uh, uh, how many millions more it is going to be, that needs to stop. You know, we need to reverse that uh, that trend. And I think um, uh, we couldn't put that into the World Humanitarian Summit report for a variety of reasons, because it would have been sort of a direct affront to uh, member states on the Refugee Migration Summit and to the Secretary General's office. But I um, believe that whether it's in the margins of uh, this year's general, uh, the, the come, uh, next year's general assembly, or a standalone event uh, after that, um, it, there needs to be some kind of a um, high-level event. Now, what's the format? If we go down the route of a, an intergovernmentally negotiated through a, um, um, a resolution and so on, um, you know that event is not going to take place before 2025. So it probably will be something that has to be a sui generis uh, e event again that uh, that aims a little bit, as I said, the London Syria conference, which actually picked policy issues but asked people to make their concrete commitments against that, also on education, on RDPs, or a little bit like the Obama summit uh, was in the margins of the, the, the uh, refugee migration summit that also led to very concrete um, commitments around the things that we all have been promoting over the years, policy changes, more investments, and so on and so forth. Great, thank you. Um, I've got more questions here in London. Joe, why don't you start? Front row, please. Thanks, Karen. I, mean, I think your lecture and um, world events make clear that the need for effective multilateralism is greater than perhaps ever before, but it's also under threat. Um, and I think your report signals how you've got overlapping drivers of movement, um, both mi migration and um, forced displacement. You indicated in your speech that 
you had many agencies within the UN who had an interest, and you rightly kind of jested about how many of them there were. <laughs> Do you think that as a result of your initiative that there will be changes in the way that the UN works together um, and a need to revisit the uh, architecture for dealing with migration and forced displacement? Thanks. Thank you. We'll take a couple more questions. Sara, you're next. Thanks, Christina, and thank you so much, Karen, for such a fascinating and candid, you know, insider view of the process. Uh, you said that there are very few leaders who understand and support, you know, see the benefit and the need to welcome um, volunteers and, and migrants. And when we did the study on the, the ripple effect of uh, restrictive Western policies on, on countries that host large number of refugees, we heard uh, how the 51 Convention was born in Europe and is dying here. And it is because so many you know, political leaders can't see beyond their next term re-election. But we also learned you know, systematically about how many voluntary organizations in a space of a year had sprung up in Europe, 216 in one year, to try mm. and help people who were coming, you know, over last year. Um, we, we, we heard how when the um, Prime Minister Cameron talked about swarms of migrants, immediately that was followed by loads of people going online to donate to these volunteer organizations because they were embarrassed by these remarks. And so maybe we're not seeing that leadership you know, amongst the politicians, amongst the political leaders, but there is leadership from civil society. There are activists. We see leadership from businesses. Business, businesses are investing in refugees mm -hmm. here in the Middle East, in a number of countries where, you know, in Kenya. Um, how do we harness that? How do we connect these initiatives? We're all thinking about it, we're all trying to do it, but we need to do it in a systematic way. Um, with there are positive government examples too, the humanitarian visas from Brazil, the private sponsorship refugee program in Canada. We need to connect them and your reflection on that would be really welcome. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna take two more questions. There was one just behind Sarah and then one just behind Joe. Hi, I'm Clea from the British Red Cross. Um, I was just, I was, um, when you spoke at the end about the importance when we were talking about it as a global phenomenon, migration, but then also the importance of looking at it from a local perspective, and I think that's very important from for the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. It's <laughs> um, fundamental. But I also wonder, um, we don't talk very much, there are regional bodies, and we don't talk very much about what role they can play, and there are very different dynamics from one region to another in terms of why and how people are moving and what support is available to them. Um, so it would just be interesting to have your reflections on how those bodies can be engaged more effectively. Thanks. Um, Melanie from uh, UNICEF UK. Um, you noted that the issue that um, held up the agreement in the end was immigration detention of children. Um, were, you, were you surprised that of all the tricky issues that there were, that that was the one that held things up? And the fact that agreement was eventually reached, even if imperfect agreement perhaps, means that there is prospect for moving forward on that issue with alternatives to detention. Okay, Karen, we've got four questions yeah. then on architecture, on civil society, on children in detention, and mm -hmm. on the role of regional organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll th let me start with the last one first. Um, uh, not surprised because of the, the country that was the holdout. <coughs> it's not surprising. Um, and, but I think that what you've suggested is, is perhaps where we need to go, is to suggest alternatives. Um, <laughs> if, if we don't think they should be detained, then what do you want to do with them? You know, where are you going to, are you going to put on a kind of miners or somewhere, something like that? Um, I, I think that there... There are things that, that are being done and will be done in most places on, on this issue. Uh, so there, there may be those couple of countries that are difficult uh, for, they say, legal reasons, or they say for on the behalf of the child, but uh, one has to, to, to deal with those. And I think that, that there, there, there are possibilities. And uh, the fact that you embarrassed the one country to have to give in on the last day was kind of serious, I think. Uh, and taken seriously, uh, there's a little bit something, and it, certainly that's how it's been interpreted. And then, so the follow-up to the the, um, 
uh, the, the summit and any of the written documents to say that detention will be reduced, you know, at least, and we work on that. The same thing about camps. We had something on camps. Camps should be um, uh, rarely used, if ever, like two. It's a, you know, I mean, we're not going to get rid of camps right away, but we would try to reduce camps that are not such a good place to stay if you can. And if you get people resettled, then you can maybe reduce some of the camps and so on. So if things all work together, you know. Um, yeah, I mentioned, I, I kept throwing in the word regional because that's, um, uh, that's really important. That's what I said. We did, uh, you know, the traveling. I didn't even mention Cairo. We went to the Arab League. We went to the African Union. We went to the EU and so on to discuss these things. And of course, so you meet a lot of people who are really interested in these things. Um, who, who wanted you to come when others didn't. And sometimes we went to the region because we couldn't get the people in New York uh, agitated about these things. So we went, you know, the Africans were not cooperative, you know, and these are my people, why are they not doing this, you know? And so uh, we, went, we went to the, this, the root of the, of the whole, whole thing and hoped that they'll get messages back to the people in New York, and that helped somewhat, in fact, in, in terms of especially these regional groups that were doing all the lobbying with each other, you know, so, you know. So I think, yeah, I, you know, we, we're talking, we really want to emphasize the global, the host communities, the villages, the people on the front line of accepting refugees. And they need to be helped. You know, you need to, to help those mayors in those villages and, and who are doing a great job of, in accepting people, but they, well, they don't have the means, you know, especially when we talk, you should have the kids in school. You know, well, yeah, that's nice to say. We should get resettlement places. That's nice to say, too, you know, but uh, we have to work on it. And, uh, and you, have, you have the UN agencies responsible for these things who helped promote the way these things were written up in the, in the documents, and they're going to be following them well, I think, you know. Um, the, the overlap drivers in the agency interests, see how the UN work together. Yeah. Oh, that's, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, that is the value of a summit, not just getting the 193 member states together, but getting the, the 14 UN agencies together. Because again, they, they come in from different ways. If you're talking about uh, drugs and crime and trafficking and smuggling, you're coming in from a different place than those who, uh, the UNHCR that wants to help everybody, you know, and help everybody move if they want to move. Or those migration people who want people to be able to move and so on. So it was, it's good to have seen them have to come together and to have those agencies in the United Nations, like the Global, Global Migration Group, who brings in all of them together, and then they have to, you know, listen to each other at least. And I think uh, that was one of the benefits of this, the whole summit too, is to get the, not just the 993 countries to talk to each other, but to get all the agencies from their different perspectives to, to talk together. I mean, that's what was so interesting about doing it re regularly with the working level, the technical people, and then taking it to the heads of agencies who weren't always terribly well briefed by the persons who'd helped us organize that, the document for that meeting. And then uh, they had to come along too and then uh, work with each other and listen to each other. And so it was not just these, you know, it's like the Department of Public Political Affairs in the United Nations too, you know, inside the secretariat who were who brought into this too, as well as the ones that had a specific mandate for either refugees or migrants, so, you know. And we had a question about civil society, I don't know if you want to. Civil society, yeah. Yeah, oh, I thought she made a good speech. I didn't think it was a question. <laughs> what you said was great, so, yeah, yeah. No, we got, we, yeah. Um, well, that's what I said both ways. We've said it both ways again, that we need everybody working on this together. Um, uh, the civil society has to, to add, you know, the local people have to, you know, give their voice to this and the, the leaders have to take that up and to have to give some leadership and if they don't do it, then to be pushed by civil society and so on. And I think uh, in some countries that works better than others or you have stronger civil society organizations than in other places. But I, I don't know, it's, uh, it's sort of the way of the world now, I think, you know, people are getting involved and the more we get involved, usually the better it becomes. Mm. Great, thank you. I'm going <clears> to <throat> use my uh, role as chair here to extend the time a little bit. It's now 7.30, but I think we've got enough questions to ask that we can go a few minutes over if that's okay with you. Um, so we've got a couple more online questions, and then I see Alex here in the room um, for maybe a final word or a final question. Um, two people online. Stacy would like to ask, what are your thoughts about how we can address and manage conflict between refugees, migrants, and host communities? not just regarding shared resources or responding to fears, but also how to discuss different cultural values. 
Then we have a question from Sarah Collinson, the H an HPG research associate, who would like to ask, has Western-style democracy become one of the main forces jeopardizing the protection of refugees and vulnerable migrants? What responsibility do media organizations have here? And then maybe Alex, responsibility I'll take who, who has? What responsibility do media organizations media. have in this regard? Mm -hmm. And then we'll take Alex a question from you and finish up with that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I think my, my question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, Alex Thier. Uh, I don't know if it's working yet. Uh, my question is actually very much in line with the, the last question. I think mean, something you already touched on, but maybe a good way to end is that at least in the United States, we have a, an August and long tradition of people demonizing refugees and then becoming the those refugees becoming the establishment and, and then demonizing the next uh, wave to come behind them. Or their wives, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, we also, and, and, and particularly I think the era that, that, that I grew up in, we, we also have this, this proud notion of the country is a melting pot and that people mm -hmm. coming in and strengthening the fabric of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder if you can, think back a little bit historically uh, to the things that have made us proud of the tradition of migration um, and, and maybe extract from that some of the, the ways in which we need to be thinking about communicating uh, both internally to our domestic audiences particularly um, and externally um, to, to start changing some of that dynamic back to a more, a more positive frame. Hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, how do we address the management? Well, that's the thing. When we say um, we have to address uh, conflict and poverty and, and climate change and other sorts of things, probably the conflict is the hardest one to figure out. I mean, I, as I heard, uh, working on the Syria Commission for six years now, and the conflict just gets worse, and you have a conflict that it's almost impossible to resolve uh, as far as we can see. Uh, and even if it's resolved, it's going to be bad for everybody <laughs> rather than good for anybody. Uh, so that's uh, something that I think everybody needs to work on, like the ODI, Alex, uh, yeah. um, and others. Uh, <laughs> I, can, I hope so, yeah. But also the UN agencies who have, you know, are supposed to be working on the, these sorts of things, the uh, you know, Department of Public Information and, and others, and that's why they have a very extensive plan on... Um, on the together campaign of who you know who they're reaching out to and showing the the benefits of uh, overcoming the, the conflict uh, and I think those of you who've talked more about internally displaced persons when we talk about the 65 million for, six forcibly displaced we're talking about 20 million refugees and the rest are IDPs so I mean they're a bigger lot and they're in a worse shape because uh, you know they they're subject to their own government in this, you know? I mean, uh, where you're a guest somewhere, maybe you get a little better treatment in some countries, uh, although not everywhere, of course. Um, certainly, yeah, um, I always tell the story, which I probably shouldn't, of one of the people who worked on the, uh, one of the ambassadors, uh, when, when the negotiations were going in a funny way, and I said, why do you think of this? You know, what, what are they doing? And she said, um, Karen, I've told you many times, democracy is bad. So, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we began to think that was true for a while. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I just saw Hamilton last week, too. Um, you forget what our, if you're talking historically, those guys would do bad, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, interestingly bad, but bad. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think all through history there are good examples and bad examples, and what we need to do is to push the good examples and to, to try to convince people and show the benefits, as we say, of diversity instead of thinking it's, it's much needed to stay and just be like ourselves. We, uh, people, that's what we say. People who meet a refugee or migrant are surprised often. They're just, oh, people like us, you know, they're not different, you know. That's, that's, that's the thing. Why, why not uh, get more people together if we can? In that, in that sort of sense. So um, those are some of the things we try. Um, but, you know, uh, learning about history and looking at history is sometimes helpful and sometimes frightening because you wonder if, uh, if it's gone on for so long or if it reappears like 
like Australia, what are they doing? You know, we always think of Australia in a different way. Everybody wants to go and live in Australia that I know. Um, you know, I don't know if they still do. You know, it's, it's not the people I know, I guess. I don't know. Um, the, 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 yeah, the demonizing refugees, um, uh, no, melting pot. Um, you know, if, if populations don't like melting pots, then it doesn't have to be a melting pot. So it's a little more like a mosaic and so on. What's wrong with that? Uh, we don't have to become like each other, but we ought to be able to respect one another. And, and as I say, find it interesting to learn different things from different people, things that, that are, you find out might be really positive, might be something that appeals to you and something to keep pushing for. And, to, and once you're convinced, then you should try to convince some others. Um, so we expect these things from institutions like yours and other ones that we have here uh, represented. Um, and uh, people who can, can help pull us all together and push others who are maybe not quite with us yet. Yeah. We'll do that. We'll help to push. Yeah. Listen, um, thank you very much, Karen, for answering our questions, for putting up with our debates, um, and you know, for, for enlightening us on all that was summit um, in September of last year. Um, for everybody else, thank you for coming. Um, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this uh, recording of this, a video recording of this, will be online in about a day or two's time, so you can refer to it then. Thank you so much to our online audience. I hope you found it enjoyable listening in. Um, and thanks to all of you for your questions as well. Take care and have a good evening. <laughs>